Today on the show, we expose the Tribunal of Morrowind and the Throne of Lies upon which they sit. Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and universes of our favorite video games. I'm Connor. And I'm Bruce. And we're here again for Elder Scrolls. Back at it again. We're returning to Tamriel. It's been a while. We haven't gone to the wonderful place that is Tamriel in a, in a minute. So, glad to be back. Same here. I'm ready for the land of wizards and Adra and Daedra and uh, men and myrrh and such. That's right, and it, it's especially a big twist today because you're in my house right now. <laughs> We're yeah. recording on location. I'm in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, in a separate, uh, in a in a locked, dead bolted, and uh, inescapable <laughs> sound treated recording environment. If I'm still alive after this recording, please help. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce is no longer my co-host. He's my hostage and co-host at the same time. I was so serious about doing an Elder Scrolls episode again, and he wasn't quite sold on it, so I had to <laughs> kidnap him uh, to get him to do it. No, I'm kidding. But I think for we were legal both reasons, excited. this is a joke. <laughs> to be clear, that was a joke. No, I think we were both really excited to get back into Elder Scrolls because I think as we've talked about in so many conversations, both in person and over the internet, just like there's so much. There's so much uh, dirt there to dig through, and it's all so wacky and interesting. Exactly. Uh, we've barely scratched the surface on this, and I'm really excited uh, about this topic. Yeah, for sure. I, I got especially interested in just Morrowind, just as a setting and as a place and as a game. Like the game Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind is just particularly mysterious to me. I, so I, I, what I wanted to talk about today, specifically when it comes to Morrowind, is the Tribunal. Uh, this group of three living gods, basically, who held this unique position in history, the history of Morrowind, the history of Tamriel, and, you know, wanted to dive into the darker side of their origin story and how they kind of relate to the villain of Morrowind, a gentleman you might have heard of named (laughs) Dagoth-Ur, kind of the the back and forth and the uh, dynamic between these two entities. So I'm excited. We'll, we'll, uh, We'll get into that as, you know, it's kind of Dunmer history, uh, you know, the, foundi- the foundation of Morrowind as a province, and uh, some dark origins is what we'll get into. Absolutely. And I, I do have to say for myself, I, I think I've explained this before, but I only got into Elder Scrolls until like I had watched like a little Let's Plays of Oblivion, but I really mm-hmm. started with Skyrim and, you know, I played that all the way through and then I just poured over all the, you know, different lore stuff. And yeah. uh, especially when I went to like Solstheim and everything like that and learned more of the Dunmer culture, it felt like that entire, the entirety of Morrowind um, from the culture to the religion, it feels almost alien. And I know like mm-hmm. it all seems alien, but this culture and this world feels especially just completely isolated. And yeah so disconnected from the rest of the world uh, in terms of, you know, who they are, how the different, you know, cultures and castes work, and uh, Mm. especially the religion, uh, which we're definitely going to be talking about. And I find it so fascinating when we talk about the Dunmer, the origins of like the Dunmer kind of transforming from like a previous race and like mm-hmm. their connection with other like mer races that were kind of there in the time in you know millennia before anything that we see in the game happen. That's right. Yeah, th- there's a lot to the history of the Dunmer and sort of the the way their culture changes over the centuries. I, I I'm with you a little bit. I I wish I had had more hands-on experience with Morrowind the game uh, back in the day when it was new. Morrowind actually was my first Elder Scrolls game that I was ever exposed to and actually had hands-on with, but I didn't play it all the way through. The first Elder Scrolls game I played all the way through was Oblivion, and of course I got into Skyrim too. But uh, Morrowind, uh, yeah, there's that sense of mystery, and like you, like you referred to, the sense of almost otherworldliness. It's kind of alien. There's, it's a very different and very unique setting, even compared to settings like Cyrodiil and Skyrim and other you know, places we visit in the Elder Scrolls games. 
So no, without further ado, uh, I'd love to just start diving into it. But first, a really quick uh, round of housekeeping. I want to remind our listeners that we love to hear from them. Mm-hmm. We absolutely adore all of your stray thoughts, suggestions, comments. Uh, let us have them. <laughs> uh, email us at podcast at loreparty.com with your thoughts and episode ideas. Uh, we also stream every now and then on Twitch, so be sure to follow us on twitch.tv slash lore underscore party. And of course, you can connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at lore underscore party. Yeah, we actually had uh, someone like contact us over Twitter. That's right. About Elder Scrolls. I, I don't have my phone on me right now, but I would totally give you a shout out. You know who you are. Actually, yeah, a really quick shout out to Alexander Weston. Uh, I, I do have my DMs open, and uh, Alexander Weston uh, DM'd both Bruce and I a little while ago, I think back in May, uh, to say, hey, listen to your Elder Scrolls religion and Soul Gem episodes, loved them. Thank you again so much. I think we already expressed our gratitude for the uh, kind word earlier, but really quick shout out to Alexander Weston again. Uh, but that that could be you next time <laughs> if you if you choose yeah. to DM us, we could shout you. Slide out into well. our DM. Absolutely, uh, don't be shy. But yeah, let's uh, let's start getting into it. Um, Absolutely. But first, we'll take another quick break to hear from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. So stick around. All right. Okay, we're back, and I just wanted to uh, say before we really start breaking it down is that you know. I think this thing that I really seized upon and got really interested in in my research was, you know, Dagoth Ur. You know, most of us are aware of him as the main bad guy, the villain of Morrowind, but I started just getting this itching feeling under my skin, like, no, the Tribunal are a little bit of secondary villains too, and I'd like to explain why. But to do that, (laughs) to make sense of the story (laughs) of the Tribunal, uh, we have to kind of go all the way back to the founding of Morrowind itself. Morrowind, for context, is, of course, the, it's known as the Dark Elf homeland. It's where the Dunmer of Elder Scrolls live. Uh, but it's also a province of the Empire of Tamriel. It's uh, kind of on the eastern side of the continent. And it was originally founded, or originally settled, I guess, by uh, several different tribes of elves uh, who originally came from the Somerset Isles to the far west. Uh, these inhabitants originally included the Dwemer. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of them. They were also known as the Deep Elves or the Dwarves, had many different names. But also, in addition to the Dwemer, was another group called the Chimmer. Uh, I'm going to say Chimmer. Uh, it could be pronounced. Yeah, I'm going to say Chimer. Chimer. But it's Chimer. Yeah, interchangeable. It's yeah, potato potato. Uh, which, but all you need to know is that the Chimmer uh, is how I'm going to pronounce it. Uh, that translates from Old Mary with the language of the Elves to changed folk. So you had the Dwemer and the Chimmer. Basically, the Deep Elves and the Changed Folk is what they were known as. Uh, and, and what's interesting is both the Dwemer and the Chimmer, they moved to Morrowind and became these separate tribes, but originally they were basically Altmer. They were kind of descended from High Elves way back along the way. So, you, like, I, I think an interesting theme of Elder Scrolls is just the, the variety of Elves that exist in this world and kind of their, you know, intergenerational uh, relationships. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, it's like a Galapagos island of <laughs> myrrh. It really is, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for, uh, so for a long time uh, after they kind of, like, uh, were their own different races, the Chimer and the Dwemer lived in, you know, relative peace uh, throughout the land of Tamriel mm-hmm. uh, and even fought together against the invading Nords from Skyrim, right. who in turn were men that came from the uh, continent above Tamriel. That's right. However, the Dwemer, uh, who revered, you know, knowledge, technology, they were the first to, like, really put a lot of effort into, you know, mechanics and whatnot Mm -hmm. uh, and ingenuity. Big inventors. Um, Yeah. mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And the Chimer, who were more, you know, zealous, they were very, um, you know, religious, uh, very traditional. Yes. Yeah. And they revered the Daedra as gods. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, They could no longer kind of, like coexist yeah. as the Dwemer kind of went further and further away and, you know, got really deep into their, into science and, you know, mechanics and technology as they were kind of, as the Chimer were kind of sticking with, again, the traditions and the worship. And so the two declared war on each other, creating the epic battle at Red Mountain. Mm-hmm. And this is like a culminating 
huge, cataclysmic event. Final showdown on Red Mountain. Yeah, that's the big right, one. right. And I mean, and a lot of a lot of shit went <laughs> down. Uh, that is lost to time. Uh, one of which is the greatest mysteries is that is the last time we ever see you know an entire race of uh people right the dwemer yeah at all the dwemer they just, mysteriously vanished at the battle of red mountain uh completely just poofed just went away there are a couple of exceptions i think there's one surviving dwemer that you can meet yeah. during the game morrowind but yeah for, for the most part yeah this entire race of elves just vanishes and to this day, no one knows how or why, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do an episode. I, I, I accept that challenge. Uh, but no, it's like you said, Bruce, Red Mountain was a gigantic turning point in the history of Morrowind. That's when the Chimmer basically defeated their Dwemer rivals. The Dwemer just vanished and left all their technology behind. And, you know, you could say this battle was essentially won by one person, a... Uh, a champion of the Chimmer people, a gentleman by the name of Indoril Nerevar. Now, remember Nerevar, because he's very, very important to the story of the Tribunal, also to the story of Dagoth Ur, the story of Morrowind mm -hmm. itself. Uh, Nerevar was essentially the folk hero of his time. He was a celebrated chieftain of the, Ch of the Chimmer people. I think he, he was like the George Washington of the Chimmer, pretty much. Like he, he, oh, I was going to say Hercules, but I oh, like that yours too. better. Yeah, that's actually better. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but like... He, I think George Washington works even better because he's like also kind of in politics sure. and like nobility. Yeah, leader. Yeah, yeah. But no, he, yeah, he's he's Herculeshington. <laughs> George Herculeshington. Herculeshington. Yeah, <laughs> Herculeshington. I like that. But he um he, he wasn't alone in leading his tribe though. He had several close friends who helped him uh, kind of reunite Morrowind after the Battle of Red Mountain and be uh, leaders to the Chimmer people. Mm -hmm. At the time, one of these close advisors was a guy named Vorin Dagoth, as he was known uh, during his life. He would later be known as dagoth -er. But there were three others, Sotha, Sil, Almalexia, and Vivek. Now, these are also... And Vivek. Yeah. Remember all these names. Yeah, these are also... Ver this will be on the test. Uh, these are <laughs> also very important names. So these four advisors were Nerevar's closest friends, basically. dagoth -er, Sotha, Sil, Almalexia, and Vivek. And, uh, you know... After the Battle of Red Mountain, uh, there was work to be done, basically. Like, like we mentioned, the Dwemer disappeared, but they left behind some uh, interesting artifacts. There were these... Yeah, they left behind so much of their technology yeah. and their homes and everything. That's why, like, you know, you can just go into any, you know, Dwemer temple mm -hmm. that are in uh, the underground places of Tamriel. Mm -hmm. It's just completely untouched because they all just... Poof! Yeah. Di disappeared. Yeah, they didn't like migrate somewhere or go on vacation. They, they it, it was like it was like the rapture. Like they just dropped what they were doing <laughs> and just went away. So yeah, all of their belongings, all of their dwellings are just intact. Like like they just vanished into thin air. No, specifically, there were three very very important artifacts left behind that uh, Nerevar and his uh, his advisors came across. Yeah, it was the um, they were experimenting on the heart of Lorcan. Mm -hmm. Sunder, Keening, and Wraithguard. And these were like theorized that like they were trying to look into it. I'm like, this might have actually been part of possibly their disappearance, but they looked mm -hmm. at it as uh, artifacts that could be used to bring them individually into godhood. That's right. Yeah. Sunder, Keening, and Wraithguard were what were known as the tools of Kogranok. The, the tools were exceptionally powerful artifacts that, like, yeah, like you said, they were kind of designed to interact with the Heart of Lorcan. And if the Heart of Lorcan is familiar to you, you might remember from a previous episode, we discussed the Heart of Lorcan and explained how the Heart of Lorcan is basically a fragment of a god. <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> what was left behind by the quote unquote original spirits that created the world. So think of the Heart of Lorcan as a fragment of a very powerful long gone deity that was kind of just left behind when the world was created and these three tools that the dwemer created uh they sort of invented were yeah like you said they were capable of granting immortality and this immense power and at the end of the the battle of red mountain nerevar and his advisors they were now in charge of the tools it was kind of like well these are ours now but what are we going to do with them and so 
While he was trying to decide what, you know, what course to take, Nerevar decided to leave Dagother, his, sorry, Vorin Dagoth at the time, uh, in charge of the tools. And then he kind of went back home to consult with his closest advisors. Uh, interesting side note, Amalexia was actually Nerevar's wife at the time. So mm-hmm. it was his wife, Amalexia, and his two best friends, Sothasil and Vivek. And the group of them sort of, you know, just put their heads together. Like, well, guys, we have these... Uh, these ridiculously powerful tools that the Dwemer left behind, what are we going to do with them? And My best friend going to figure <laughs> out what we're going to do with the god tools. Hope nothing happens <laughs> like betrayal. I, I love you three guys so much. You're, <laughs> I, could, I could never fathom an, uh, a scenario in which I can't trust you. Uh, especially my wife, who <laughs> definitely. Especially. So eventually, you know, there was like a pinky promise and there was a, <laughs> an agreement between... <laughs> Uh, Nerevar and his three friends that they would keep and study these tools, but they agreed, again, remember, they pinky promised, this is serious, they agreed not to use them to gain power. And I'm wondering if they were, you know, fingers crossed behind the backs, maybe, <laughs> but we'll, yeah, we'll get to that I later. Because you have to do think about this. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is basically unfathomable, infinite power. Yeah. You can heal the sick you can live forever you can have limitless energy it is just truly the the core of a dead god yeah that is it's a lot of temptation yeah and 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 if you're the leaders of the chimmer and you just vanquished your dwemer rivals slash cousins and you you might be thinking like who else but us like if if anyone's going to have these tools and you know this type of access to power it should be us, you know, we're, we're in this position because we earned it. We, we deserve it. So no, yeah, why, this, not? This, why shouldn't I have it? <laughs> well, after all, why not? yes. So <laughs> it's, it's extremely tempting. Uh, and in, in fact, we find out that the temptation was too strong for Dagother himself, because when Nerevar mm-hmm. returned to the heart after conferring with his friends, he found out that Dagother had become corrupted by the tools and he refused to relinquish them because yeah like like you know we've explained this is this is power this is immeasurable power and coveting that power is pretty understandable dagoth Ur became obsessed with this godhood that the tools and the heart promised and were capable of granting yeah and like you know this is <sighs> my god <laughs> uh, in in official records uh nerevar killed dagoth Ur. that's what um, the story goes for- yeah yeah, for trying to, you know, use these tools. Mm. Um, and they were then mortally wounded in the process. Right. Uh, and then uh, the three advisors, the three, you know, the pals, the best friends, <laughs> uh, broke their pinky promises uh-huh. and used the heart uh, to basically become gods. Yeah. Uh, and they renamed themselves. They, are, they were no longer just, you know, these, uh, the advisors of this nobility. It was the tribunal right this is you know the the new tribunal and however you know <laughs> there's a lot more uh than the official records say this is you know all through you know yeah morrowind dwemer propaganda dunmer, or sorry dunmer that's, <laughs> propaganda that's that's true yeah and it, it's it's it gets a little sketchy here because they, these are still kind of Technically, these are still the Chimmer. Uh, they haven't become the Dunmer yet. We'll get to that soon. Right, right. Uh, but no, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot. But no, it's, it is funny how there's this really squeaky clean, tidy narrative that the Tribunal, now that they are gods and they rule over Morrowind, they determine what history is. And that sort of, like we said, authoritative or official record that, that you know, the story you're supposed to believe, it says that, yeah, uh, Nerevar and Dagoth are fought to the death and uh, they both died and uh, us three, the, the three amigos the three gods, the tribunal, were all that's left and so uh, don't question that that's the story, uh, don't, don't worry about it uh, go, about your, uh, go about your day and worship us <laughs> so, but, but yeah we'll, uh, we'll peel the curtain back soon and take a look at sort of the uh, lesser known side of these events after another quick break to hear from our sponsors Okay, so we've gone over some of the background on how the Tribunal became the Tribunal and sort of the story of Nerevar and Dagoth Ur and this tale of tragedy and deception and betrayal. And yeah, like we, like we mentioned, this kind of ushered in a new regime in which the Tribunal were in charge. 
and they just they determined what the official story was. But there's another but. side to this story. There's a there's a version of the events that uh, some people uh, privately hold on to and. They try not to say out loud too loudly because they can get in trouble. Don't believe the media. It's the big <laughs> lie from Dunmer uh, institutions in the establishment. There's fake news. So saith, so saith the Ashlanders. That's right. Uh, who That's are right. A, a tribal sect of uh, the Dunmer mm-hmm. who refused to worship the tribunal. That's right. Yeah, they, they, they thought that the tribunal are full of uh, fake news. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's this kind of outcast group. Of, of elves in Morrowind called the Ashlanders, yeah, who uh, they believe, they think, that Nerevar was actually murdered by his three closest friends because, you know, like we mentioned, the, the temptation is, is palpable and they just, you know, couldn't help but lust after that power that Nerevar had sort of forbidden them from pursuing. So there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a story that goes that one night uh, Nerevar was getting ready to, uh, you know, just have a quick meditation before bedtime and uh, Sophacil, Amalexia, and Vivek poisoned him with, like, uh, you know, poisoned incense, poisoned tea. It, some, some backstabby, duplicitous way of killing Nerevar, getting him out of the way. And now that Dagoth Ur was gone, too, no one could stop them from using the tools on the Heart of Lorcan to become gods. Uh, so and so that's the that's the unofficial uh, uh, record of events. <laughs> There's the abridged version, you know, the real <laughs> one they don't teach you in school. Right, right. <laughs> So listen up, kids. Your cultural gods killed your other George Washington <laughs> Hercules figure. And then all the kids just nod and say, yeah, that tracks. That yeah. makes sense. All yeah. those words add up. Absolutely. <laughs> but you do have to think, I mean, we're not just kind of operating in a vacuum here. Mm. Tamriel is part of Nern, which is only just the material plane mm-hmm. of a large macrocosm of different planes. And of course, those who have dominion over those planes and those who have dominion over Nern, in which there are already Adra and Daedra uh, and gods who exist on this plane. And right. I think you have to kind of wonder to yourself, how are, how are they going to kind of <laughs> feel about that that's a very good question yeah <laughs> especially considering like we talked about before how devout the chimmer used to be before the battle of red mountain before the tribunal came along like we mentioned the chimmer were very spiritual they were very serious about honoring and worshiping uh the deidric princes that they saw as gods if you haven't already i highly recommend you go back and listen to our episode on the aedra and deidra kind of explaining the differences between them but they are basically the gods of of uh, tamriel uh but there were specifically three uh, Deidric princes that the Chimmer were especially fond of. There were Azura, Mephala, and Boethia. And so, yeah, after the Nerevar's death and Dagoth Ur's banishment, the tribunal basically made themselves the de facto rulers of Morrowind, which in turn displaced and kind of usurped uh, this other tribunal of Deidric princes that their people had worshipped for centuries. So it was like a very sudden out with the old gods, in with the new gods thing. That's such a, you know, serious paradigm shift that happened so quickly. But that's, that's, what, that's what it was. Uh, yeah, and I, I can definitely understand the people kind of going along with this because, I mean, one, uh, the gods are now, you know, next door. And you don't really want to... <laughs> they live you know, in the palace down the road now. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to kind of piss them off. Right. Um, and so, like, it was... It was a big change. What I had also read, though, was that, and and though this may be propaganda itself, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was uh, a thing about uh, how, as again, we've talked about on this show before, uh, kind of the the apathy and sometimes even downright viciousness Mm -hmm. um, and negative events that Daedric princes kind of impede upon mortals, uh, men and women alike. can be pretty cruel sometimes. When they feel and like they it. don't really like give a shit. Yeah. Uh, some of them do. I would say like, you know, if, if anyone, Azora is like probably one of the uh, ones who like give a shit the most, oh, but yeah. they are ultimately kind of a, a, a disconnected. They don't know what it's like to be mortals. They That's don't right. know the plights of their people who worship them. That's right. And, you know, I could definitely understand if there is a large amount of them who felt kind of you know, disenfranchised yeah. uh, by this, you know, ages long since time immemorial 
deities who didn't really give them a lot of attention. And then yeah. here comes like three people who have, in your eyes, proven themselves and, uh, you know, went the distance and, you know, got around. Uh, they went around the horn uh, like an adult <laughs> and they, they did it the hard you know, way. Went, they did it the hard way. They went and killed their friend, possibly, allegedly. Allegedly. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they became gods. And I yeah. like, there could be an easy transition for that if, you know, if things beforehand were so shit or difficult. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Like the Chimmer people just seeing three of their own, three of their hometown heroes, three of their uh, leaders uh, ascend to godhood. I, I, I can see the appeal of that. Like my gods are right here, right now. I could go talk to them if I, if I you know, really wanted to. As opposed to Deidre, who you have to kind of go to a shrine and make an offering and maybe they'll whisper to you in the, in the night. Like, it's, I can understand the appeal. Like, the tribunal kind of changing the face of the political and spiritual landscape of Morrowind overnight. It, it makes sense when you think about, you know, they're just coming off of the Battle of Red Mountain and, like, this, you know, historic time that they're in. So, yeah, it, it, it makes sense, but... Uh, like you mentioned, Bruce, the Deidre can be uh, a bit petty, a bit vengeful, uh, and they weren't entirely happy with uh, what how this went down because no, they were not. <laughs> the the uh, tribunal did not go unpunished for their transgression because you got to remember they broke their promise to Nerevar by using the tools in the first place. And you could it's also possible it's alleged again <laughs> that they murdered him too. So mm -hmm. yeah, by by obtaining godhood kind of through this dishonest means i guess uh they made uh azura in particular pretty angry what did azura do about it though it's pretty <laughs> wild this punishment azura it's came up with super weird <laughs> i first of all first of all she the first thing i do need to say she let them live yeah um yeah that's I, again azura i would say like i'm not surprised by that but like j just daedric princes have done much worse oh, yeah, for, for much, much less. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Azura is definitely one of the nicer ones for this. Yeah. If it weren't, if it weren't Azura, I would imagine that, you know, Morrowind would be a smoldering crater oh, yeah. uh, where it oh, is yeah. now, which I mean, it's not too far off. actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she on her, like on her way out, I'm just like, you guys suck. This was really bad. <laughs> and she <laughs> took all, um, she cursed the tribunal, uh, and their kin. And uh, the the Keimer were, uh, I believe, gold tinted. Their skin was like yeah. uh, a brilliant gold. They look and, like Altmer, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they they changed them to an ashen colored skin mm -hmm. with burning red eyes, That's uh, right. creating them uh, from the Keimer to the Dunmer. That's right. That is why the Dunmer look the way they do. That's why they became known as the Dark Elves because they were cursed by Azura and bore a collective punishment for the crimes of the tribunal. So it's kind of like direct cause and effect. And what's, what's interesting is you can actually see this transformation. In a, a great example of it is Vivek himself. Uh, during, exactly. During Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, while you're playing, you can actually uh, visit Vivek in the game, and he appears uh, as like having half of his body uh, having kind of golden skin, the, which is the original hue of the Chimmer, as we talked about, and the other half darkened like the Dunmer. So, like, it's split right down the middle vertically. Like, he physically bears the price of the tribunal's betrayal. It's, uh, you know, like, I can look at my right side of my body and see what I used to, what the, uh, the Dunmer used to be, and I can look on the left side and I can see what the Dunmer are today. It's pretty wild. Yeah, what I also had read about Vivek, which is, who is a very incredibly fascinating character, is that um, he, I, I believe that it was also like he had done that for himself because he wanted to better understand uh his people and the people that he serves mm, uh because on one half he is you know Chimer, on one half he is dunmer uh he is also apparently intersex so huh. he could better understand um you know all people wow who may or may not have um either of those or both of those and you know it, it was it, it was a way that vivek wanted to uh better get perspective i think again wow. it comes from that side of i want to better represent and better serve the people who worship me because the daedric princes did not do that great a job and i want to be better than that interesting 
So Vivek might be the soft-hearted one of the tribunal. He actually wanted to be a better god to his people than the Deidre had been before. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Unfortunately, though, the tribunal's uh, era of ruling over Morrowind would not last. There, Eventually, uh, Dagoth Ur would return in physical form. Because it turns out that when he was killed by Nerevar, he clung to life by, you know, his... But due to his proximity to the heart of Lorcan, but he eventually was able to come back and he started to attempt to finish what he had started. I also believe that uh, Nerevar uh, was actually uh, part of Azura's revenge as well. That's true. Saying, yes. I'm, I'm going to bring them back too, so they're going to also be able to uh, exact their revenge for what you guys did, because I right. know what you did. Right, Nerevar kind of serves the double purpose of coming back to stop uh, Dagoth Ur, who wants to, again, come back and take control of the heart of Lorcan, rule over uh, all of Morrowind. And yeah, like, we'll get there, but... So, Dagoth Ur's grand scheme is basically to overthrow the tribunal, become the god of all Dunmer, and also, he wanted to banish the Empire from Morrowind. He, he wanted to sort of go to war with the Empire of Tamriel, do this, you know, Morrowind belongs to the Dunmer thing, you know, I, I maybe uh, maybe Ulfric Stormcloak uh, learned from him down the down the line. <laughs> but, yeah, this uh, is a very similar song and dance. A little bit, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like you like you mentioned, Nerevar was reincarnated uh, and and sort of guided along this journey by Azura. So uh, that's part of Azura's revenge as well. And Nerevar is actually the player character. That's who you play as in Morrowind Three, or sorry, Elder Scrolls Three. Morrowind is the reincarnation of Nerevar, and so. He, as the as Nerevar, you the player, you're guided toward a confrontation with Dagoth Ur by Azura, and you're assisted by Vivek, because you know the tribunal can't really stop Dagoth Ur on their own, and so that's kind of down to you. However, there's a bit of a drawback because by defeating Dagoth Ur, the Nerevarine, the reincarnation of Nerevar, also severed the tribunal's connection to the heart, which rendered them mortal. So, it's a good news, bad news scenario, like, <laughs> hey, Dagoth is not going to kill you and take over Morrowind, but you're also not gods anymore, uh, so. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> and this is, this is, first of all, karma at its greatest. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty late, pretty fucking late, but. Centuries um, late, but yeah. <laughs> centuries, I think millennia, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, Azura always gets her man and <laughs> eventually, she, <laughs> and this is a huge pair again, a paradigm shift, but mm -hmm. also it, it again brings things kind of back full circle. It's not right. like, okay, now there's a power vacuum. Um, but you know, their, their grip, uh, the false tribunal is what we now kind of refer to them as, mm. um, kind of lost their iron grip hold on the spiritual and political uh, sphere in Morrowind mm -hmm. um, undid kind of everything um, that they kind of set up in this culture and everything. Yeah. And the original three tribunal Daedric princes returned to be the now de facto tribunal, uh, Azura, Boethia, and uh, Mithala, mm -hmm. uh, to become now known as the true tribunal. That's right. So yeah, it's it was like the uh, the usurpation and the uh, the coup that the tribunal basically uh, did back in the day. It's been reversed now because of uh, the Nerevar's reincarnation and Azura's meddling, and yeah, things are kind of back to normal after yeah, like we said, centuries if not thousands of years. And yeah, it's it's like that's the ultimate defeat. If you're the tribunal, if you're Amalexia, Sophocle, and Vivek, like you're. <clears throat> you're going to see that as the ultimate failure is like, not only are you not gods anymore, but the people are starting to call you the false tribunal and the Deidric gods that you replaced are now the true tribunal. It's kind of like, fuck man, like you <laughs> really fell hard and fell far oh, shit. Yeah, at that point. I mean, honestly, I feel like that was <laughs> like a really good deal that they got. Yeah. Cause again, I have seen these Daedric princes do yeah. so much worse. You got to be gods for a few thousand years, and then after you pay for the sins, not of the Father, but of yourselves, you then just, all right, now you're mortals again. That was yeah. a weird loop. You're done. <laughs> all right, you had... You I, had I don't you... know what's going to happen after they die. <laughs> it's right. not going to be great because your soul goes to one of these fuckers. <laughs> 
Yeah, I guess you'll just find out when you get there. But, <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, you had your bite of the apple and time to give it back. <laughs> so you're back to being mortal again. I hope, I hope you had fun. Hope you made the most of it. <laughs> but yeah, so like it's, you know, Vivek, Amalexia, and Sotha still, they have to just kind of go back to being uh, normal folks after that or uh, and their their regime is toppled they're not in charge anymore and it's basically their their house of cards that they had built on a bedrock of lies remember because they betrayed Mm -hmm. their you know kind of cheated their way to godhood uh they've yeah they've been replaced again uh just the same way that they replaced the gods before them so yeah it's kind of cyclical kind of uh a, a cycle but it's interesting to me you know i'll i'll expand on this later but it's uh, interesting to me how Dagoth Ur is not really the only antagonist of this situation. Uh, the Tribunal are kind of j- just as selfish in some ways. Vivek obviously has uh, selfless uh, uh, motivations as well, but as a group, the Tribunal kind of, you know, not that different. You know, and, and they, they, they built this regime on false pretenses, and it came back to bite them. So I did actually want to know what all did the people of Morrowind understand what happened through the events of Elder Scrolls 3? Hmm. Did they know about, like, everything? Like, did they have to topple the, you know, statues that they built of Vivek and Olamexia and Sothasil? That's a good question. I, I'm guessing most common folk of Morrowind and most of the Dunmer, most of the people living in that province, they probably aren't aware of the reincarnation of Nerevar coming back or Azura sort of intervening to both stop Dagothar and sort of strip the power away from the tribunal. I'm guessing most people don't know about the really, you know, specific bits and pieces of it, the mechanics of how it all happened, but I'm sure at some point it came down, you know, it became common knowledge that the tribunal are no longer immortal, they are no longer divine. Maybe they, I think what well, well, what happened is they became saints. They were still like important people, but they mm-hmm. were no longer the objects of worship. So it's kind of like, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 I'm looking at it as, you know, from a high level standpoint, at least uh, I'm looking at it as really just a pretty simple changing of the guards where it's like, all right, we already have tribunal temples everywhere because so the Sil, Almalexia and Vivek built them everywhere and instituted them. We already have all these tribunal temples. Why don't we just kind of replace the plaques and like replace the statues and you know update the hymns a little bit and then new we king. just yeah <laughs> new coat of paint <laughs> otherwise <laughs> business as usual doesn't really change that much we still go and pray to uh three deities specifically in the deidra in general uh other yeah it's it's mostly kind of like kind of like how people just accepted that the tribunal were the new gods back when they first gained power i'm guessing it was a pretty simple transition of oh okay they're not gods anymore like People just sort of accepted it, I'm guessing. Yeah. I kind of think it's uh, probably around the same uh, vein of, you know, when Talos was ascended to godhood yeah. and the, the Nords were just like, hell yeah, nine yeah. divines. Right. Yeah, it's, it's nine now. Yeah, <laughs> the eight plus one. Yeah. Or <laughs> after the Great War during kind of the Skyrim era when most imperial citizens had to sort of stop worshiping Talos. They had to start saying, oh, it's back to eight again. <laughs> it's no longer nine divines. <laughs> it's, not like, it's, it's one of those things like you just have to kind of establish a narrative and people will either accept it or they won't. But by and large, as a society, they, I think people just generally kind of go along to get along. And so I'm guessing yeah. that's what they saw in Morrowind after the tribunal's fall. Yeah, I would imagine it's definitely uh, near like how a lot of polytheistic uh, religions in antiquity kind of uh, accepted new gods uh, from other cultures and they were just like, okay, there's more. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or yeah. Like, uh, oh, we're not going to do Saturnalia anymore. It's Christmas now. Like, okay, close enough. Like it's, yeah, it's (laughs) paganism sort of being adapted into. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Being adapted into early uh, monotheism. It's like, it happens. People just sort of flex and Mm -hmm. go with it. Yeah. Uh, No, that's that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, But I do have to, this was weighing on me as I was doing my research and what I was already feeling every time I had ever read or interacted with uh, the Dunmer people and the culture, none of this crazy soap opera pantheon bullshit surprised <laughs> me. And mm-hmm. I was like, why is that? <laughs> uh, because I, to me, I always felt that the Dunmer were already like just because of like their the houses and their culture they always just uh, especially those who are just on the higher 
echelon of the hierarchy in the Dunmer culture just felt like they were, you know, chosen, ordained, um, Mm -hmm. that they deserved what they had. Um, Mm -hmm. And seeing the, you know, Keimer Dunmer paradigm shift um, from worshiping Daedra to worshiping essentially themselves, like it, to me, this feels like something, again, (laughs) I feel like falls more in line with the Altmer, which are like, mm. they're they're very close to the Dunmer, but the mm. High Elves, like, they love just gushing about how, like, they were the closest descendants of the gods right. uh, before, you know, they, you know, became mortals and everything. And you would think that this would be their kind of, like, history. But instead you see that, like, it it tapers off from them and it goes to the Dunmer, who felt like they really, really deserved this. And they saw all everything lining up and they did it. And with the false tribunal, uh, you know, kind of solidifying and confirming their suspicions, because I think that the, the traditional aspect of their culture being zealous and being, you know, wanting to have this whole worshiping the tribunal of Daedric Princes mm-hmm. was also a, sort of a whole thing where... They were still, again, the Keimer close to the Altmer saying like, oh, that's my, that's my great, 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 granddaddy. Right. The ancestor worship. Yeah, exactly. So I, I wonder if it is kind of that um, that vanity, that, you know, sense of entitlement that I kind of sense in a lot of the different, you know, I, I would say like noble mer like the high elves and the mm. dark elves. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think that is. Definitely something you could argue that when the when the Chimmer sort of split off from the Altmer and then you know settled in Morrowind and eventually became the Dunmer, one of the things they really held on to, and th- there weren't many because we've established the Dunmer and you know the Chimmer before them, they were fiercely independent. Like they really kind of wanted to do things their own way. But we've also established they're a very traditional people, and I think that's one of the things they really kept from their ancestors, from their Altmer, uh, you know cousins is is this kind of importance that they place on tradition and hierarchies and you know honoring those that came before honoring those better than you and kind of like it's yeah it's a hierarchical society and like especially if you put it next to maybe like the khajiit or even the bosmer the wood elves like that's a that's Mm -hmm. another type of elves who i think aren't as rigid in their social hierarchies as the dunmer and the altmer are so it's not necessarily just an elven thing. It's I think it's like a, it's just a cultural artifact that the Chimmer and then the Dunmer just happened to sort of hang on to. Uh, when yeah, they... yeah, but I wonder, like, if they were in, if a different race was in that same position, mm. would they do that? I'm not sure they would. Yeah, that's what I, I that's what I mean. Like, I think it's uniquely a uh, Dunmer thing to, you know gravitate toward kind of powerful personalities. And so when the tribunal came along, it was pretty easy for most Dunmer to kind of fall in line behind them. Cause like, yeah, those are, those are us. That, that's that. Those are our boys. And well, two boys and a girl, those are our people. And they're <laughs> like our heroes. They're our gods. And yeah, just kind of respecting that hierarchy and worshiping the gods that are strong enough and present enough to deserve being worshiped. I think, I think if you put like, I don't know, I'll just say like the Red Guards in that situation, like the mm-hmm. Red Guards are a type of human in uh, Elder Scrolls. And I think if you just made some of the Red Guards gods, I think you'd still have a lot of, you know, sectors of that society going, no, nah, I'm good. I'll stick with my Aedra, like, or I'll, I'll keep honoring the, the uh, Nine Divines or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's some independent spirits that just wouldn't cling to that narrative so easily, as, as easily as the Dunmer did when the tribunals kind of came and went. Well, I mean, I would even say that we have an example of uh, the Dwemer who made all this shit and sure. just kind of left it behind. We don't know what happened to them, but it sure. looked like it did have to do with these very powerful artifacts, and they're yeah. gone now. We don't know what they did, but we do know that they did not create, you know, a, a millennia-long tribunal, you know, <laughs> right. godhood thing. Right. Gods were just such a non-issue to the Dwemer in general. Like, the Dwemer had this attitude and it was so different. Like it was, they were so different from the Chimmer that it, they went to war over it was this the attitude of why worship gods when you can create them basically was, you know, the Dwemer's attitude. So yeah, like there are elves where, you know, 
this idea of an organized religion that everyone kind of falls in line behind does not uh, gel with everybody, especially not even other elves. So yeah, I think there is something unique about the dumber and you know, they kind of share this with the Altmer is this respect for hierarchies and kind of respect for traditions. I feel like if the Nords got it, they would just be like, all right, we're going to get rid of all the elves. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make Tamriel big Skyrim. <laughs> God. Oh, you're probably right. <laughs> okay. But to bring all of this home and put a bow on it, uh, we've covered a lot of bases here, but I want to wrap, wrap this up uh, kind of neatly with, now that we know the whole story, uh, I, you know, this thought that keeps coming back to me is that it, it's clear to me now that the Tribunal and Dagoth Ur you know, these two, you know, one, one's a group, one's an individual, but these two sides of this issue, they had pretty similar motivations. Like, mm-hmm. Dagoth Ur desired power, influence, and immortality. So did the Tribunal. And, of course, there are, you know, outliers, like we, we've talked about Vivek, like kind of really wanting to use his power for good and uh, serve his people the, and, and understand them, like you explained, like really understand them at a deep level. But at the end of the day, they all kind of did what they needed to do to gain this power. The difference is, the, the main difference between the Tribunal and Dagoth Ur is that the Tribunal got away with it. Yeah. Dagoth Ur made his gamble and tried to seize power and failed both times, actually. The first time, Nerevar killed him, and the second time, uh, the Nerevar's reincarnation killed him. So, like, you know, Dagoth Ur didn't get away with it, but he kind of wanted the same, you know, not the same thing as the Tribunal did, but they coveted the power that the tools of Kagranok and the Heart of Lorcan offered them. So, you know, the Tribunal, at the end of the day, they they had to stab their friend in the back to get their godhood, uh, and eventually that came back to haunt them. So that's, if that's not, you know, a villain getting their comeuppance in, in at least mm-hmm. some way, I don't know what is, you know? Yeah. And, um, I don't know, for me, there's a, there are a couple things that kind of stick out and are staying with me. Uh, first of which is, um, just during my research, I have found that, uh, there are some people saying that the Dunmer people of Morrowind kind of accept that, both of those iterations of whether or not, you know, they were kind of doing this behind his back after his death or uh, that they actually did poison and kill the Nerevan mm-hmm. to just as a kind of, you know, both could be right, both could not. Um, and I think that's, it, it says one thing about them kind of like allowing for contradictions because I think they care more about what is in the now, what is here. Yeah. And it, it, like, regardless of what happened, the tribunal is here. I'm not going to badmouth them because, you know, you yeah. know, I don't want that kind of heat. <laughs> exactly. And again, I feel like that also goes in line and coincides with their culture and their, you know, need for tradition. Uh, mm-hmm. The Dunmer as an entire society and culture are incredibly conservative. So they sure. want to just kind of, you know, whatever is easier of a pill to swallow, uh, as long as you get to the same conclusion. Um, you know, I think that is really what they're going for. But another right. thing that just keeps staying with me is regardless of what their actual intentions may have been, the false tribunal wanted to become gods because they wanted to do better Mm. they might have felt that they were owed it for Mm. the trouble that they were going through they were of the highest nobility and the greatest exemplars of their people right but you know if you had gods that were you know benevolent and um helpful and better understood you would you even have that kind of temptation Mm. it still stays with me that you know i Everything, every little story about the Daedric Princes is about like, oh, yeah, and that's why, you know, this sect of uh, people don't have belly buttons because, um, <laughs> you know, a Daedric Prince was really bored on a, uh, a Mundus afternoon and <laughs> they just wanted to fuck with someone. Right. Um, there's a huge disconnect between, um, you know, these Daedric Princes and the people of Tamriel. That, you know, I could definitely, again, just totally understand just wanting to completely circumvent and just be your own gods. 
you know, um, damnation without representation. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, if you're not seeing the gods that you want to see in the world, you got to become the gods you want to see in the world. <laughs> become the divinity that you want to see. <laughs> Well, that about wraps it up. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please take a second to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us grow the show. And be sure to connect with us on Twitch, Instagram, and Twitter at lore underscore party. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.